All right, let me invite you to grab a Bible and join me back in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. Uh, and as you turn there, you know, I was thinking we were giving glory to God earlier. I, there was an item I, we should have mentioned, too. Somebody graduated from Bible college yesterday. Um, Adam. Adam, praise God. Thank you for that. Thank for that. And, and something else might be happening soon to him as well. Uh, Hannah, Hannah as well. Yeah. All right, Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. Uh, as... We look there together. Let's pause and ask for God's grace and help. Father God, we're just so thankful for your word. Your word is perfect. It revives the soul. It is sufficient. It is, Lord, everything we need for life and for godliness is found in your truth. It reveals to us your son. And I pray, Lord, at the outset here of our time, that your spirit would illuminate the text in front of us, help us to see, help us to understand, pierce us where we need to be pierced, heal us where we need to be healed. Lord, we pray that you would do a work now as only you can do as your spirit wields the sword of the spirit. We pray that you would be glorified during this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're reading our text, Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. This is what Luke writes. Now after these things, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul, has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. Even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander from the Jews, who had, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew... For about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that, had fall, that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in this regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. 
for those who have ears to hear. Let them hear the truth of God's word. All right, do you guys like word association games? You know how to play those, right? I say, or personally, I say something, and you, you say the first thing that comes to your mind. So I want to play a game, a word association game with you here this morning. However, probably can't blurt it all out at the same time. So just do it in your mind, okay? You can do this. I know you can. All right, first thing you think of when you hear the word idol. First thing you think of when you hear the word idol. Maybe a little statue. Maybe a pagan temple. Maybe your mind went to American Idols, not the show, but the idols that we love. Maybe maybe you went to the show, I don't know. Um, maybe you went to the idols that we love in America, like power, money, sex, relationships, things like that. Okay, next word. Spiritual warfare. What's the first thing you think of when you hear spiritual warfare? Probably, I'm guessing, you're thinking Satan, demons, maybe exorcisms, maybe some kind of spiritual attack. But here's my question for you. When you first heard the word idol this morning, did your mind immediately go to spiritual warfare? Anybody? Why, why do I say that? Uh, I'm guessing that probably most of us don't think of spiritual warfare when immediately we think of idols. And I can make the argument that these two subjects are strongly linked together. Strongly linked together. We read, or Eric read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul makes a statement that almost seems contradictory. I mean, it was hard, it's hard to understand. On one hand, he mentions, well, idols aren't really a thing. I, I, there's no such thing as idols. They're, they're not real. And yet, even though there, there's no such thing as Zeus or Artemis, okay, yet there's forces behind these things which are real. There are forces underneath these things that are demonic in nature. Okay? So while Zeus and Artemis or any other pagan god you pick doesn't really exist, there's a spiritual reality underneath all idolatry. And that's true for any god, any idol, any religion outside of Jesus Christ. I know that's not popular to hear. But any religion, any god outside of Christ is demonic. And so the source and foundation of all these things come from the enemy. Paul says in Colossians 3, 5 that covetousness is idolatry. Do you know that? Coveting is idolatry. Why? Because what Paul is indicating there is that it's not just the pagan gods which count for idols. It's also anything that you elevate in your heart to a place that's above the Lord. Anything that you covet, that you desire more than you covet God, that you desire God or Christ, is an idol. Tim Keller writes a lot about idolatry uh, and helpfully writes counterfeit gods is a great book if you've never read it but this is what he says he says anything more than god here's what idolatry is anything more than god that is functionally more important to your happiness hope identity and meaning that is functionally your god so if you're finding your happiness your hope your identity and your meaning in something functionally more than God, more than Christ, that is your God. That thing is your God. So I know that we would never say, if you love Jesus, you're, you're never going to say, well, I love my job more than God. But the reality of idolatry is you don't have to confess that with your mouth for it to be a reality with your life. Idols don't need your confession. They just want your time. They want your talents. They want your treasures. And so we have to remember that idols themselves are not necessarily evil in themselves, right? They could be good things like family, spouses, relationships, work. Not evil in themselves. In fact, blessings from God. But we could take something that's a blessing from God and make it, make it an ultimate thing in our lives and make it our God itself, and so we need to see that the devil doesn't care what idol you worship, whether it's Artemis or whether it's your career. He just wants to rob God of the glory that belongs only to him. 
He's fine, whatever God you worship, so long as it's not Jesus. And so our text is fascinating because it's a riot, and who doesn't love studying riots? <laughs> right? Okay, but here's what we got to remember. It's a riot. We need to remember what we just studied uh, last time we were in Acts two weeks ago. Okay, Paul has been in Ephesus for how long? Who remembers? At least two years, okay? And he's preaching the gospel and he's teaching about Jesus and he's also performing many miracles and powerful signs. You remember how people are bringing his sweat cloths and his aprons so that he, he, he might, they might heal people with just the stuff that Paul was wearing. And we also remember that there were some itinerant Jewish exorcists who were saying, I, I cast you out by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And what we saw was there was a reverse exorcism that took place where the demon said, I know Jesus and I know about Paul, but I have no clue who you guys are. And he threw them, stripped them and threw them out of the building. And what is that telling us? It's telling us there's a lot of spiritual warfare happening in Ephesus. And that led the Christians, those who confessed Christ, to do what? There was this massive book burning, right? Of all the magic scrolls they had. And there were so many magic scrolls in these houses of believers now that it was millions upon millions of dollars that were burned. Now, keep that context in mind. Because I'm guessing that Demetrius heard how much money was just burnt, okay? Keep that context in mind. We're looking at this riot in Ephesus, and I want you to know these are not unrelated events. The spiritual warfare that's taking place in this city, it's not unrelated to this riot. And so our text this morning reveals the spiritual forces behind idolatry always conflict with the gospel of Jesus. The spiritual forces behind idolatry always conflict with the gospel of Jesus. We're going to study three phases of perpetual spiritual conflict happening all the time. Okay? So first phase of perpetual spiritual conflict happening is the gospel threatens idolatry. The gospel threatens idolatry. Now, before we jump into the conflict, we see Paul's traveling itinerary in verse 21. Take a look at it. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul clearly is feeling pretty good about the work in Ephesus. He's there for a long time. The church is probably, he thinks, is in a good enough place that he can now leave. In fact, it seems the Spirit is leading him to leave. He stayed for a couple of years. Now he's ready to go. Where does he want to go? Well, verse 21 tells us, and it also serves as a basic outline for the rest of the book of Acts. Okay, if you want to know where we're going in Acts, here it is. It's a kind of a circuitous route, isn't it? And so he wants to go to Macedonia, that's where the churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea were, amongst others. Then he wants to go to Achaia, which was where Corinth was, and Athens as well. And so he wanted to do that, and he does do that in chapter 20. From Ephesus, Paul then wants to, go from, to travel to Macedonia and Achaia. That's west. Then he wants to go Jerusalem. Is that what direction? You have a map in mind? East, right? Go west, then go east. Then he says, I must see Rome. Now, where is that at directionally? From Jerusalem. Really west again. Now, that is not an efficient traveling plan, is it? Especially in that day where he's not hopping on a plane, right? Why would, plan, why would Paul plan such an inefficient travel itinerary? Well, Luke doesn't specify, but most likely it's because he was taking an offering back. We were talking about in Sunday school. An offering back from the Gentile churches in Macedonia and in Achaia and taking that offering to Jerusalem. But notice what he says after Jerusalem. He says, after I've been there, I must see Rome. Now, when you read that, you need to see, this is not a sightseer saying, well, I really, I must see Hawaii, right? That's not, that's not the purpose here, okay? This is the language of divine necessity that Luke uses in the Gospel of Luke and Acts. This was mission language. I must go to Rome. Paul, this is impressive. I mean, he has contentment with his money or lack thereof. We read about that in Philippians 4. 
he is not content with how far he's spreading the gospel. You see that? He, it's not, hey, Paul, you did a good job. Take a break. You should really hang, just, you know, relax for a bit. He spent all that time in Ephesus, all that time in Corinth. He went to Athens for Pete's sakes. You're doing great, Paul. And he's like, no, it's not enough. I have to go to Rome. And guess what happens when he goes to Rome? Or at least what he tells the Romans at the end of the book of Romans. He says, I want to go to Spain. He wants to spread the gospel. It's not enough. As long as God gave him life, he was going to carry out this mission, which was to tell people about Jesus. And he wanted to do it as far as he could and as wide as he could. So look at verse 22. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So he sends two helpers along. One guy we know pretty well, Timothy. Young guy from Lystra, do you remember that? He was been, he's been with Paul through a lot of his journeys, and so he's going to send Timothy. But what about this other guy, Erastus? Paul mentions in Erastus in Romans 16, 23, and 2 Timothy 4, 20, he was the city treasurer of Corinth. It would be surprising if somebody who held that official kind of post was doing missionary work in other cities. So that would be a real shock if that was the same Erastus Either way, Erastus was a common name. Not so much anymore today, but it was back then. We know either way, Paul trusted this man. And so he sent him on and Timothy to Macedonia, probably to prepare the offering that they're going to take to the, the poor saints in Jerusalem. And it's during this time in Ephesus, when Paul is here in, his, in, in Ephesus, that Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians. Okay? And at the end of 1 Corinthians, he writes about this exact time, and he says he wants to visit the Corinthians, but he's going to stay in Ephesus till Pentecost. So until springtime, Paul is here in Ephesus, and here's why Paul wants to stay in Ephesus at this point. He says, because a wide door for effective work has opened to me. We see that there. He adds, and 1 Corinthians 16, 8, 8, 9, there are many adversaries. Now, do you notice that? He says, I'm staying right now to the Corinthians. Keep that in mind. I'm going to stay in Ephesus right now because there is a wide door of an effective work for the gospel. By the way, there's a lot of adversaries, right? See, they're, they're, that's informative because effective gospel work often is paired with many adversaries. That's often the case. When we seek to serve Jesus Christ, we can expect a lot of opposition, a lot of attacks. Why do you think that is? It's because of spiritual warfare, right? It, again, we have an enemy who is not very concerned with churches who are not preaching and living out the gospel. Satan does not, I, I don't know Satan very well, thankfully, but I'm guessing he doesn't care when churches are only talking about how to best use your money and how to be more successful in this life or how to be more physically fit. I'm sure the devil's laughing. He's like, yeah, go ahead, learn about that. But I know for a fact he hates when the gospel's being preached, and he hates when people are extolling the name of Jesus Christ, and he hates when churches are proclaiming and living out the truth of Jesus. And so this is a really helpful little snapshot from Paul about this time. He says it's effective, there's a wide door of ministry, but also there's a lot of enemies. Okay, let's talk about some of those adversaries first. There's a man named Demetrius. Demetrius, look at verses 23 and 24. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines to Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. Now, Luke, in his typical understated style, said, There arose no little disturbance. What's he saying? It was a huge, massive, giant disturbance, right, happening here. And it was against the way. And remember, the way was the way that early Christianity was referred to because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when Luke says there's no little disturbance, he's saying there's this huge, massive disturbance. What was the cause of it? Well, it was a silversmith named Demetrius. Demetrius made a, a, a living. In fact, he made wealth, we're told later on making small silver shrines to Artemis. And so he brought a lot of business into the town. 
He brought a lot of business to the other craftsmen in town. And Ephesus, we know, was the home to the Temple of Artemis. Uh, we had the, I showed you the picture before of that temple. Both the, what's left of it is to the right, the small picture. And to the left, you could see that's what it probably looks something like that. It was huge. It was huge. It was 220 feet by 425 uh, feet and had 127 marble columns. You can see that there in the, the picture, right? Each marble column was 62 feet high. And so Craig Keener writes, apart from Jerusalem, no city in the Eastern Empire had a temple comparable to it. It was roughly four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens and was listed among the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was massive. The, the only temple that rivaled it was, was the temple in Jerusalem. And so this temple in Ephesus, dedicated to Artemis, they would refer to Artemis as their savior. They viewed her as a savior. She was a Greek virgin goddess who was the patron of hunting. And so if you're going to go out and hunt, you would pray to Artemis. Marshall writes that the festival of Artemis was celebrated with wild orgies and carousing. Small terracotta models of the temple have survived, but so far, no silver ones. None of Demetrius' handiwork survived. Uh, and, he, and Marshall points out, in any case, those were less likely to survive. So people from all over the Roman Empire would travel to Ephesus and visit the temple of Artemis. Now here, that's context. That's why Demetrius is so upset. Demetrius made a lot of money because of Artemis and that temple. He would make silver replicas of either the goddess herself or the temple itself or both. And that's interesting because John Calvin famously said the human heart is a factory of idols. And that's true, absolutely. But Demetrius literally had his own idol factory. Right, where he was making these little silver replicas of the temple and of Artemis. So he has a vested interest in Artemis worship. He very well may have been the, the, the uh, master of the silversmith's guild. So he gathers everybody together, his fellow craftsmen, and that wouldn't have been too hard because members of various trades would typically live and work in particular sections of town. So it's not hard. You're in a city. All the silversmiths are in the same general area. All the craftsmen are in the same general area. In fact, in Ephesus, the silversmith shops were situated on what would later be called the Arcadian Street or the Arcadian Way. And I have a picture of that as well, what it looks like today. That's the Arcadian Way, and that's where silversmith shops would be located in Ephesus. And so it was a street that ran from the theater to the harbor. And so Demetrius is upset. Why is he upset? Look at verses 25 and 26. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that gods made with hands are not gods. So Demetrius is proving to be a, a nice little demagogue. He's able to get people upset. He's able to put, bring on their, their anger and their concern. He calls on his colleagues to remember how much money they're making from their business and who is a threat to their wealth. What does he say? It's this Paul, right? It's Paul. He says that not just Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, this Paul has convinced them to turn away from idols, which aren't really gods in the first place. That's what Paul is preaching. So Paul has soured scores of people on Artemis worship, and ultimately he's denting their bottom line. You want to know if somebody's ministry is effective? Here it is. You have the guys that make idols saying, our idol business is hurting because this guy's preaching the gospel. And his message was, gods made without hands are not gods. Now, this complaint is telling for a few different reasons. First of all, 
It gives us a glimpse into the impact of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. It's taking root. People are being changed. Idol, idolatry is being hurt by Paul's ministry, but he's been preaching there for two years. And for two years, he's calling on the people of Ephesus to repent of their idolatry, repent of their sins, and turn to Jesus. And Paul's message is simple that, that at least Demetrius heard. God's made without, with hands, human hands are not God's. Now that's sound logic, if you think about it. If you can make your own God with your own hands, then you're greater than that thing, right? You'd be greater than your God if you can make your God. Don't worship a God that you can make yourself, okay? Don't worship a God who can be stolen. Don't worship a God who can go out of business if people stop turning to them. Don't worship a God who will disappear when the economy tanks. Worship a God you can't create. Worship a God who, in fact, made you and everything in the world. Worship a God that you can't see, and even if you did see him, you would die because he's too glorious. Worship a God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present. Don't make a God with a template. Understand that God himself became one of us and died in our place to redeem us from all of our sins. Worship that God. That's the God Paul's preaching about. That's the God Paul's extolling, saying, you look and understand who Christ is, you will have no desire to run to Artemis anymore. There's another implication here from Paul's preaching. How would Demetrius know his message? How would Demetrius know what Paul, he's his enemy. Is, Paul, is Demetrius hanging around the, the, listening to the church, listening to the sermons? No, he knew Paul's message because that's the message Paul was constantly preaching. It was a message that Demetrius would have heard over and over again because that was what Paul repeated over and over again and was impacting his business. In fact, in Athens on Mars Hill, you remember Paul said the same thing in front of all of those gods, all those false gods in Acts 17, 29. And Paul said, you don't think that you can make a god of silver or gold by the art and imagination of man and you could worship him. You can't do it. And so Demetrius heard of Paul's preaching and he's upset. Look at verse 27. He says, and there's danger not only that this trade of ours may become into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence she whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, I read those verses. You know what I see? I see Demetrius is concerned about three gods, not just one. What's he concerned about? Well, first of all, it's our trade. We're not going to make money anymore. Second of all, it's the temple. And while he mentions the temple, it's what Ephesus was known for. It was civic pride. It's patriotism to an extent, right? And if Paul keeps preaching, then this temple, which we're so proud of, is going to come to nothing. But then, he says, and Artemis will be deposed from her magnificence. Literally, it's the idea of pulling down her majesty. And so three big fears here from Demetrius. We're going to lose money. We're going to lose our place in the respect in the Roman world. And we're going to lose our God herself. Right? His gods, and I say gods, not God, his gods were being threatened. They were being threatened by the gospel. His money was being threatened, and that was a god for Demetrius. And his civic pride was being threatened, and that's a god for him. And, and also his Artemis, his, his goddess was being threatened as well. And he knew that this Jesus movement was a threat to the things that he loved the most. And to his credit, he's right. Jesus is a threat to all those things, okay? Because Jesus does not tolerate polytheism. He doesn't, okay? The Roman Empire, this world Paul was living in, that the New Testament was, was written in, that, that world was a polytheistic environment, okay? The Romans did not care that you wanted to worship Yahweh or Jesus. What they cared about was you were saying that they're the only ones to worship, that's what they were upset about. 
And Demetrius was able to perceive that God, that Paul was preaching a faith that did not tolerate all these other gods, okay? Paul preached there's one God, there's one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one way to be saved. And so to come to Jesus means what? What does it mean? It means you have to forsake all the other ones. It means you have to forsake them. It means that you can't find your, your functional identity, your hope, your happiness, your meaning in, in these other gods anymore. To come to Jesus is to make him the most important person in your life, more important than your family. We talked about that last week, didn't we? More important than your own life, more important than your job, your wealth, your comfort, everything. That's why the gospel of Jesus is always a threat to idolatry. It is. Jesus does not allow compromise in allegiance. He does not allow compromise in his followers. And so you can't worship Jesus in money. Okay? You can't worship Jesus in a human relationship, a spouse, a loved one. Jesus must take precedent over every other idol. And so here's that perpetual conflict. We see the gospel threatens idolatry. This leads to the second phase of conflict. And what do, you, what do you think it is? Idolatry attacks the gospel. The gospel threatens idolatry. Idolatry th- uh, attacks the gospel. Look at verses 28 and 29. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion And they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. So everybody's all whipped up. The craftsmen are angry. They're whipped up in a frenzy. This Paul guy is threatening our gods. He's threatening our money. He's threatening our livelihood. He's threatening our temple. And they keep crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the whole city's thrown into confusion and they're yelling about, about how great Artemis is, and a crowd formed. And what do other people see when they see a crowd forming? But join the crowd, right? They join the crowd. They join in. And they become part of the pack. That is not uncommon. Scholars point out that mob scenes were a common part of Hellenistic urban life, okay? It was common. And so if you saw everybody gathering together, like, hey, are we rioting about something today? All right, let's do it. They're jumping in. And so the natural place to go if you're going to write is the theater in Ephesus. Now, don't be thinking of a movie theater, okay, or anything like that. The theater in Ephesus has been excavated. I have some pictures in the slideshow as well. It was a large outdoor amphitheater. Can you see that in the pictures? Uh, estimates believe it could hold 24,000 people. 24,000 people. And so they all end up here at the theater. What does the mob do? They don't find Paul. So they grab two of Paul's traveling companions, Gaius and Aristarchus. Don't know a whole lot about these guys other than what Luke tells us. They're two of Paul's guys that would travel with him. We're not told they assaulted Gaius and Aristarchus, but I mean, they do imply that they used force. They dragged them. And Paul heard what was happening. And what does he want to do? Look at verses 30 and 31. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Doesn't that tell you a lot about the type of guy Paul is? Generally speaking, if you hear that you were the cause of a city to riot, there's a, there's a fight or flight mechanism that kicks in. For a lot of people, are like, oh, they're angry about me. I think I'm going to run or I'm going to hide, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this city, something like that. And then there's Paul, who says, they're rioting because of me? I'm going, right? Let me at him. That's like after he got, st- was it Derby when he got stoned? What did he do after he got stoned and didn't die? He's like, let's go back in the city, right? I mean, he, this is a special kind of person, Paul is. His instinct is to go in, and I, I'm guessing, Why does he want to go in? Well, that that place held 24,000 people. I'm sure he saw, I could preach the gospel, right? He's a preacher. 
He's like, right, they're, they want to hear from me. I have an opportunity. And so what Paul had was he had some level-headed friends. He had some brothers and sisters who were saying, no, Paul, you're not going there, probably because they knew he would die if he did. And even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of Paul said, don't go to the theater. Don't you go. Who are the Asiarchs? Asiarchs were guys who held the highest provincial office in, as an Ephesian city, and they were aristocrats, basically. It's interesting, Paul had friends in high places, right? These Asiarchs were concerned about him. They were prominent people in the city, and they were saying, no, you should not go. And ultimately, we can look at that and say, that's God's providence protecting Paul from himself, okay? Protecting Paul from himself. So the sad thing is, there are many people here are the Ephesians, they're there, they're at the theater, they're fired up, they're yelling, and they don't even know why they're there. That, isn't that humanity? Well, I'm really, really upset about something because everybody else is, but I don't know what it is. Look at verse 32. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. The mob of people are crying out different things. They're like, well, why are we even here? They don't know. They just saw an angry mob, and they said, I'm in. Yeah. And so Luke tells us that the Jews tried to get involved, verses 33 and 34. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense of the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so Luke is assuming we know who Alexander is. I, I think with the situation that's happening here is the Jews wanted to disassociate themselves from Paul and the Christians. And so Alexander was probably one of their leaders. He said, all right, get, he's our spokesman. Alexander, go up there and, and you tell everybody that we're not with those guys. We're not, this is not us. We're not with Paul. We're not with these, these Christians. And Alexander's trying to, and he's motioning with his hands. like, guys, guys, listen. And what happens? He just gets shouted down by the crowd. And to the crowd in Ephesus, the Jews are monotheists. The Christians are monotheists. <laughs> You're all the same. All right? They don't have the ability to determine the, the difference in doctrines between the Jews and the Christians. And so for two hours, they're chanting and shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine that? This was a frenzied mob. They're, they're running high on civic pride, on love of money, and love for their false god. And this riot was not caused because Paul was slandering people. Was it? It was not caused because Paul was stealing from people. It was not caused because Paul, in the middle of the night, spray-painted on the temple, Jesus is the way, right? Right? It's not like, you remember in Judges and when Gideon tore down his father's idol at night? You remember that? Because he was too afraid to do it in the day? It's not like that. Paul wasn't breaking down the temple. What was Paul doing that caused this? He preached the gospel. And that's all it takes. If you focus on the gospel, if you preach the gospel, all those other idols, all those temples, they'll come down. Right? They, they, they'll come into conflict. And so we talked about how Jesus demands total devotion and he calls on us to forsake our idols. This reaction in Ephesus also reflects to us on how idolatry works. Because if you take something that's nice and something that's good from somebody, they're going to get mad at you and, and maybe sad and maybe they won't speak to you for a week or something like that. That's true. But if you take a God from somebody if you take what's most important to them, they don't just get mad, they don't just get sad, they go ballistic, right? They go ballistic when you mess with their gods. When you mess with what's functionally the most important thing in their life, where they find their identity, where they find their meaning and their hope and their happiness, when you start messing with that, they don't just get angry, they fly into complete complete fury. Why? Why is it such an extreme reaction? The nature of idolatry leads people 
to find their core identity in that God, okay? Those gods, even though they're nothing, they're spiritually backed, right, by demonic forces, which means they're powerful, which means they control the people who worship them, which means every idol, every idol requires your time and your sacrifice. And I've heard countless accounts of how people fall into idolatry and they don't even realize it. A pastor talked about having a relationship with a professional athlete. The athlete had trusted in Christ. He was a Christian and he played his sport, but unfortunately he had a career ending injury. And suddenly this athlete was depressed. He was sullen. He was inconsolable. His life was over. He was ready to die, right? Why? Well, he did not realize that being a professional athlete had become his functional idol, had become his God. He knew and affirmed the gospel of Jesus, but he had a higher functional God than Jesus, and that was being a pro athlete. And when that was taken away, his life was over. He didn't want to keep living. He re- he, and what happened was, that was all taken away. And he was confronted with that idolatry. In his life, he fell to pieces. Now, praise God. He realized his idolatry. He repented of it, and he turned to Christ. That's why the crowd of Ephesus is so angry. Right? That's why they're having this riot. They had, they had a core fear that the most important gods in their lives were threatened, were in trouble. Artemis was in danger. Our city pride is in danger. Our money is in danger and that leads to riot right and so we need to realize that idols are cruel gods okay they never deliver on their promises in fact when you have an idol your idol will always require you to die for it it will never die for you ever they are powerless to save you. They might make you happy for a moment, but in the end, they will force you to die for them. They are not willing to die for you. And that's where Paul has the gospel, which tells a different story of a different God who came to this world, who willingly laid down his own life for you, for your sins, so that you could live forever. So that you could be reconciled to God. You see, idols call on you to make a thousand 10,000, 100,000 sacrifices to them. They'll never sacrifice for you. But in Christ, we have a God who gave up his own life so that we might live forever and ever. He calls on us then, having trusted in him, to die to ourselves every day because he's already died for us first. So that's the second phase of perpetual conflict. Idolatry attacks the gospel. Let's look at the third phase. The gospel prevails over idolatry. In case you want to know how the story ends, the the gospel prevails over idolatry. So I'll be completely honest with you. When I first started started studying this text, I thought the ending is a little anticlimactic, right? I'm just being honest with you. Like we would expect, here's this great riot happening in Ephesus. Surely this thing's going to end with Paul giving a fiery sermon, Right? Or, or some kind of dramatic, supernatural act of God delivering the Christians from Ephesus. And instead, what happens? We have a very pragmatic speech by a town clerk who probably was not a believer. Right? Is that how you want to end this, this riot? A pragmatic speech by a town clerk, and yet this is what happens. And what we need to understand is, Who was the one behind this speech? Who is the one behind the resolution of the riot? Who was the one protecting the church, protecting the Christians? It was God. It was God. Look at verses 35 and 36. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. So first, question. Who's the town clerk? Okay. The town clerk was the highest, one of the highest officers in the Roman city in Asia. Okay, in Ephesus, he would have been the main magistrate of the city. He would have had a staff of clerks who worked under him. Some have equated him to basically the mayor of the city. 
okay? And so this would be the right guy to speak into this situation in Ephesus. He's able to quiet down the crowd. How does he do that? Well, he massages their fears by saying, listen, guys, everybody knows how great our temple is. Everybody knows how great Artemis is and that Artemis' temple is right here in our beloved Ephesus, right? Everybody knows that. And he mentions how the great stone fell from the sky. What's that about, right? People conjecture perhaps it was a meteorite that they came down, they found, and they put into the temple and worship, but we, we don't know for sure. And so he says, nobody's going to deny these things. Calm down, be quiet, and don't do anything stupid. It's, it's a lot of common sense, right? Calm down, be quiet, and don't do anything stupid. Keep reading. Look at verses 37 through 41. He says, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So the city clerk says, Aristocrats, Gaius, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything sacrilegious. They're not blasphemers of our goddess. You think, is he paying attention to what Paul is preaching? Um, the word sacrilegious here, by the way, literally means temple robbers. So the, certainly the Christians did not steal anything from the temple of Artemis. Paul was not there spray painting graffiti on the side of it or anything like that, right? That, that wasn't happening. What about blaspheming? Paul spoke a lot about how idols weren't really anything, right? And how you can't make a God that you can make with your own hands. But perhaps the city clerk was referring to the fact that they weren't specifically blaspheming Artemis. That might be the case as well. Either way, he's arguing what? You can't condemn these Christians. They did nothing wrong. In fact, he's giving a legal precedent for the Roman world that Christianity is not in opposition to Roman law and order. He's, he's saying they're okay. They're not lawbreakers. And instead he's saying if Demetrius has a problem, Demetrius can go through the Roman channels of, dis of solving disputes. But as it stands right here, who's guilty? This, and this is, what, this is what he's saying. The town clerk's saying, really, we're the guilty ones here, not the Christians. Because we're, we're doing things out of law. We're causing a riot and... The Romans could charge us with a riot and strip away our freedom. That's a real fear. Ephesus was a free city in the Roman Empire. You could lose that if you're going to be rioting and having these kind of mob scenes. They could lose their privileges. And so here's the voice of reason. It's not Paul. It's not Aristarchus. It's not Gaius or anything like that. It's a nameless city clerk who quiets the crowd and sends them packing. Is this anticlimactic? Um, no. This is God providentially using unlikely people to protect his, his people, which, by the way, you see throughout the Bible. This is a common theme you will see throughout the scriptures where God will use the most unlikely of people, unbelievers even, pagans, to protect his chosen people. It's happening here all over again. And so here's what we need to see. Remember that what Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers. This is what he says. This is found in Ephesians 6.12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know those verses, that verse, right? Remember who it's written to. It's written to the Ephesians, to this church. Make no mistake about it. There are evil spiritual forces behind this action in Ephesus, behind this riot, behind these idols. There are evil and spiritual forces at work in all idolatry. All idolatry. And so how do we combat the forces of sin that is present in idolatry that we struggle with today? 
Because this is not just a past problem. We still run to idols. We still find hope, happiness, meaning, and identity in things other than God. We do. And the danger is it's subtle. It's it's like that professional athlete, right? It's before you know it, it's there. And then when you lose it, you're irrationally angry or sad or despondent. Why? Because your hope and your identity is in something that can be taken away from you. You need to place it in someone who can't. Place it in Jesus who died for you. And so what do we do to combat idolatry? Number one, if you go to Ephesians 6, you know what Paul tells you to do? Put on the armor of God. You put on the armor of God. After he says about our enemies or these spiritual forces, he says put on the armor of God. But before you put on that armor, in Colossians 2, we're told that Jesus disarmed the powers and principalities and put them to shame. Open shame. Jesus defeated Satan and his followers and embarrassed them. He he had a victory parade and he paraded them around as the losers, okay? He did that by dying on the cross, paying the price for our sins. So you want to know the key to winning this battle of idolatry every day? It's turning to Christ daily, meditating on the gospel daily. The key is you need to learn to love God more. Right? Because that's the problem. You could take a good thing, like a like family or a job, and you elevate it too highly where it becomes the ultimate thing. And so if you're going to combat that, you need to love God more. And that's not something you can just say, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to love God more then. Right? I'm just going to white knuckle it. God, I'm going to love you so hard today. Is that what you do? What stokes our love for God? What's going to grow our affections for the Lord? How is it we're going to love God more so that the reality of these idols are put in their proper light? What must we do to love God more? Meditate on his love. Meditate on Jesus. Meditate on the cross, on his resurrection, on his current work right now as as our high priest. Meditate on what Christ has done for you. Look at him, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, with unveiled face. Behold his glory. And as you behold his glory, you're transformed into that same likeness of Christ from one image and one degree of glory to another. And so idolatry, we see it in our text, is threatened by the gospel. It attacks the gospel. The only thing that's going to conquer it is the gospel. And by meditating on what Christ has done for us. And so here's what I'll tell you. Just as the author of Hebrews tells you, Hebrews chapter 12, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then when you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, then you put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of readiness to share the gospel, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. You put that on. How do you think the helmet of salvation is? It's constantly thinking about what Christ has done to save you, right? It's meditating on the gospel. That's what that armor is. It's reinforcing yourself with the scriptures, with the truth of God's love for us in Christ. Idolatry is a continual danger. You're never going to get a point in this life where you're not going to be susceptible to it. The way you fight it is by meditating on God and his love for us in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we rejoice. You are the supreme, most glorious, beautiful God who created us, who loved us, who saved us by your grace. And I just pray, Lord, as we look at a a time in Ephesus where a riot is caused by love for other gods, Lord, that we would learn from it, that we would be challenged by it, Lord, that we would be guarded against our own heart's desire to love other things more. Our hearts perpetually run after other things. I pray, Lord, that we would continually keep Christ at the forefront of our hearts and our minds and live and serve him supremely. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.